Hello, and welcome to my new channel. If you know me and have followed my work at previous outlets like Just Add Monsters, you know I have a special place in my heart for action games, and shooters in particular. Seeing as how I want this new channel to more fully represent me, my personality, and my interests, I thought it would be fitting then to start with some videos on shooters, which evolved into the idea behind this series. Throughout this series of videos, I will play and rank every shooter I can get my hands on from the seventh generation of consoles, to see which will reign supreme and which deserves to languish in obscurity. There are a couple reasons behind this, one being that the seventh generation of consoles is one I have a lot of personal nostalgia for, but there are a lot of games that I always picked up and put back down whenever I went to GameStop or looked around in a rental store. Not only does this series give me an opportunity to play all those games that I may have missed, but also see how they fare against games that we now know are classics like Modern Warfare and Halo 3. The only rules required for a game to be included is that they must primarily involve shooting as the major gameplay mechanic, it doesn't matter if it's in first or third person, and they had to release on the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation 3 originally. That being said, I wanted to start this series with a bang, not by playing good, well-known shooters from the era, but by digging into some of the worst. Let's dig into the first game in our rankings, Soldier of Fortune Payback. Oh goodness, I sure did pick a hell of a game to start this series on. Soldier of Fortune Payback is a lackluster, cliché shooter where the main draw is decent weapon handling and variety, and more flesh confetti than a happy tree friend's birthday party. If that seems like a little bit of a dated reference, then that works perfectly because this game is dated in every way that matters, and much like Happy Tree Friends, doesn't hold up at all. Soldier of Fortune Payback is a standard Call of Duty clone, thrusting players through a series of linear corridors and other environments, often padded for length with obtuse pathways, and regenerating health, aim downsides mechanics, etc, etc. But the mechanics aren't the only ways in which it shows its age. Payback takes you through a cliché variety of locales and makes no effort to avoid leaning into basically any character or racial stereotype it can as you plow through a greatest hits of minorities often terrorized in America pro-military propaganda, starting with Middle Easterners, then to South America, then Middle Easterners again with literal turbans this time, then Africa, and so on and so forth. But don't worry, you end the game killing some white people, so the clichés are probably fine, right? Yeah, there's, there's nothing offensive about the game's treatment of Eastern Europeans here, either. What's this? You know like fun, mister? Elena, goddammit, where is she? Fine. Elena is upstairs. It is area where only important people is allowed. Those floors off-limits, by order of Boss Ethan. Guards everywhere, you no get past. I wouldn't bet on that. You in for big disappointment, American. Alina no dance for you like I dance. Alina no show you good time like I do. As vile as this game can feel in 2021, for example, there are several moments where you literally just enter a Middle Easterner's home and without warning surgically dismember them with an assault rifle, it's also hard to take it seriously as being offensive because the whole thing is just so damn stupid top to bottom. It's a product of its time that reflects a lot of casual attitudes towards minority violence, but I don't think the team was racist so much as lazy in pursuing trends of the time, but adding the edgelord appeal of ridiculous gore. And when I say this game is stupid, I mean everything about it is stupid. To start off with, the enemy AI is incredibly dumb, often running straight at you several at a time. While it's initially satisfying to turn their bodies to red mulch with a few trigger pulls, the novelty wears off quickly and the game is stale as a result. The mindless shooting is fun for a bit, and there was clear care taken in crafting satisfying weapon feel and detailed reload animations, but that's not enough to make a fun or engaging shooter for five to six hours. With no real enemy variety or encounter design to utilize, the game instead resorts to overwhelming the player with sheer enemy numbers. I played it on the hardest difficulty, and I never felt a semblance of challenge that was testing my reflexes or abilities as much as testing my patience with a seemingly never-ending series of deaths thanks to high damage enemies often placed in corners and overwhelming odds that can only be conquered with a heaping serving of cheese. These parts are even worse towards the end of a game, including a ridiculous section of parking garage that's full of vision obstructions and armored SWAT members. Thankfully, that section at least had merciful checkpoints. No, Soldier of Fortune does save the worst for last in a nightclub level where you literally can't see anything thanks to the bloom slathered over every inch of the game's visuals. Which is a shame, because these two levels 
are the most interesting, or at least could have been the most interesting parts of the game if they weren't so frustrating and tedious. Even worse than these sections full of tedium are the bosses, who either put up absolutely no challenge or way too much. The bosses are notable for exactly how not notable they are, appearing randomly in awfully scripted cutscenes, which I will get to in a minute, and acting like you've been paying attention to the bland story. The story, cultural implications aside, has all the subtlety and intrigue of a mid-2000s Steven Seagal movie. I wouldn't be surprised if the character model for this gruff main character had a beer cut and a taped on ponytail. He's no Dick Marsenko is what I'm saying. Which is actually a good way to look at this entire game. It's not worth taking seriously in any way, but even by the standards of garbage mindless entertainment, you can do so much better. There are a bunch of other issues like hit detection, frame rate dips, and screen tearing, and ridiculously long loading times, which again, on the hardest difficulty, is only going to exacerbate your frustration. And then, oh yeah, those cutscenes. For some reason, with its overall lack of polish and Brainless enemies, this game already reminded me of any number of Steam Asset Flip COD knockoffs, but the first-person cutscenes with their floaty aiming and weird canned animations really sealed the deal. These parts in particular feel cobbled together with whatever the dev team could find lying around as they desperately scrambled to finish their game. Overall, the graphics for the game are mediocre at best. While the occasional nice environment pops up, the game's muddy and bland visual style, plus tons of repeated assets, rob the locales of any uniqueness until the aforementioned two endgame areas. Like the cutscene, seeing the same structures and buildings across Africa, South America, and the Middle East doesn't feel like an intentional artistic choice, so much as needing to get as many areas in the game as possible with as few assets. The blood and gore is the nicest visual element, but even with the clear work that went into it, it's still inconsistent, and heaps of body parts and blood effects can disappear right in front of you if the game thinks you might not notice. I can't recommend this game even with the blood and violence, though. It's not even good to go back to for a quick trip and some achievement hunting, because not only is the biggest achievement, which requires you to not die on normal or hard during the entire game, ridiculously frustrating, but most of the achievements are multiplayer only, I would, I would love to meet someone who dedicated the time to getting all of those, just, just to like study them, just to ask them why, what they were doing in 2007. Anyway, game's trash, don't play it, play one of the earlier games and forget the Soldier of Fortune exists. With Soldier of Fortune firmly at the bottom of our list, the next game I decided to take a look at is Turning Point Fall of Liberty. Another aim down sights, health regen shooter with a host of issues, I honestly think if Turning Point had the gore system of Soldier of Fortune, this might have been something of a cult classic. Instead, the T-rated alt-history Nazi shooter is a bloodless footnote, but not without some pretty satisfying kills that I will get to in a bit. The primary conceit of Turning Point Fall of Liberty is that it takes place in an alternate history where the Nazis win, invading New York, Washington DC, installing a fake president, etc. And yourself, as a construction worker turned resistance fighter, needs to join up with the American army and help take back America. The whole game has a Wolfenstein feel, but it just doesn't ever go far enough. It's a bummer because the box advertises alt-history weaponry and stuff, but the most alt-history the game ever gets are Nazi assault blimps and this infrared sniper rifle thing that will make you go cross-eyed if you stare at the screen too long. Being from this very specific era of console shooters, it should come as no surprise that this game is incredibly gray top to bottom. Unfortunately, it also has a lot of visual bugs, which hamper what otherwise would be nicely detailed environments that have lots of little effects like steam and water leaks flaring up around you in the middle of firefights. It makes the action scenes pop a little bit more with some appreciated visual busyness. Not too much, but enough to make it pop a bit, at least when the game doesn't have a panic attack and drop to single digit frames whenever more than four enemies and an explosion are on the screen. While the whole game does have a bit of a budget look and the Unreal Engine 3 blur coats almost everything, there are some genuinely neat environments and a surprising amount of atmosphere throughout, which is a nice change of pace from the cliché blandness of Soldier of Fortune. Unfortunately, Turning Point has a nigh-incomprehensible story, starting out with your main character being a construction worker in a very promising scene as Nazis invade New York, but unfortunately he's never really given any characterization and doesn't even seem to go on much of a character journey over the course of the game. 
even after literally joining up with the army and being part of air raids and multiple assaults on Nazi strongholds, he still is only ever seen in his construction gear? Like, nobody's going to give this guy a uniform. Really. And honestly, the opening of this game kind of tells you everything you're going to need to know about it. It's a promising sequence with some really nice cinematic action, but the frame rate begins to buckle under the scale of the large scenes of destruction. Like the rest of this game, it's a really neat premise, but it just doesn't quite come together like it needs to to really sell the whole thing. The game does its best to use its premise to tell a basic Call of Duty style narrative, but the short cutscenes and very similar character designs don't lend themselves well to any kind of narrative investment. Still, taken on its own merits, there are neat scenarios that are fun to go through, like fighting through the bombed ruins of New York or the aforementioned assault on the White House, which at one point gives you a mission to assassinate the Nazi president. So, that's, that's new for me. Much like the story and concept, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Turning Point is a pretty mixed bag. Slow gunplay with a fine host of weapons, but a dearth of ammo means you'll be looting Nazi weaponry most of the time. The weapon variety as a whole is also lacking, and mostly your standard World War II variety with a few standouts like a three-shot rocket launcher that is criminally underused, utilized mostly in staged fights against vehicles like blimps and gunboats. Gunplay itself can also be problematic. ADS takes up most of the screen, plus massive muscle flash can make actually shooting enemies at long range a guessing game on where you're actually hitting them or not. Combined with the lack of ammo, this makes for an unnecessary challenge that is usually more frustrating than fun. Plus, sometimes the ADS just doesn't seem to work. Like when you aim down sights, it won't fire and it won't move away, resulting in taking unexpected damage and more than a few annoying deaths. I can't tell if this is from like a disc scratch thing or an actual bug that shipped with the game, so I won't hold it against it too hard, but I played through the game three times to uh, get all the achievements, and it happened each time. Oh, I should also mention the fucking grenades, and the biggest splash damage range in the history of gaming. Seriously, you can be 15 feet away and still die from a grenade exploding. It's ridiculous. And being the dumbasses that they are, throwing grenades also acts as a game of fetch for any Nazis in the vicinity, leading at least one in the group regularly to chase it in an effort to throw it back or kick it away, often leading to unintentionally hilarious moments where the dumb AI will try and kick it away or take cover out in the open only to kick it into a wall or take cover right on top of it. One of the few gameplay innovations Turning Point made is a grapple mechanic that can lead to some neat moments, plus some really great environmental kills that are almost too violent for a T rating, despite little or no blood. These kills include toppling large heavy objects on Nazis, throwing them into grinders, electrocuting them, giving them swirlies, and my personal favorite, a point in the game where you kick Nazis in the nads into a furnace in an all-time great combo that would make even BJ Blazkowicz jealous. While there's no blood, this is from that magical era of shooters where enemies' death ragdoll can lead to unintentional moments of hilarity as they spasm and break every bone in their Nazi meat sacks, getting stuck in doors, floors, and moors. However, like Soldier of Fortune, this game does have some frustrating checkpoints and piles on enemies towards the end of the game, leading to a bad time, especially on harder difficulties. It also should be noted that the game isn't coded for difficulty achievements to stack, so while it is a short game, I had to play through it three times to get the achievements for beating it on hard, insane, and normal difficulties. For all its problems, I can't be as hard on Turning Point as Soldier of Fortune. They share many issues, some are worse here, and Soldier of Fortune does have the edge in satisfying moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, but I still had more fun with Turning Point. Frustrating design and all, there's a charm to it. From a neat little bomb-arming minigame to a satisfying campaign flow and variety to the ridiculous ragdoll. It also helps that despite the enemy closet encounter design, I wasn't taken out with one-hit kills where I had no idea what happened nearly as much as Soldier of Fortune. So between the two, Edge goes to Turning Point as our top game on the list for now. Finally, the last game in our list is Dark Sector, another on the long list of games I would always kind of pick up and look over in GameStop when I was 14, but never actually played. When I said I was playing Dark Sector on Twitter, I had a friend describe it as Gears of War meets Resident Evil 4, and holy shit, I've never heard something so accurate. 
Now, as awesome as it sounds, I've always heard this game referenced in disappointed tones as a below average or just bad action game with nothing going for it. So going in, I was expecting it to totally whiff everything that made its influences like Gears and Resident Evil 4 so great. But actually, I had a lot of fun with it even though I can absolutely see why it would have been rolling eyes when it came out. The first thing I noticed about Dark Sector is that this game is gray. I know it's from that Gears-inspired era of gritty action games, but it doesn't help that the first mission of the game has a black and white filter that eventually goes away, and the visuals don't look much more colorful after that. As a result, the game has a style I think is divisive. On one hand, it looks pretty good for its age, and the dingy, gross environments remind me of other favorites of mine like Condemned. On the other hand, there's very little environmental variety, so I was pretty bored of the visual style after the first few missions. The story isn't much to write home about either. You're a CIA operative, I've already forgotten the name of, who has to stop a mad scientist, evil general. You have to stop the bad guy from unleashing a virus that turns people into warframes in an abandoned and dilapidated Soviet bloc. Side note, I had no idea this game was originally made to be kinda like Warframe, and is also kinda a prequel? Look up some lore videos, it's some really cool stuff. Anyway, there are a few characters throughout the story, each having little to no motivation given, and just kind of inferring that they all have history together. It's pretty cliche, and while it tries to end the story with a message of redemption, it's hard to care when we don't ever really see what the main character... Um, Mason? Cliff? Clint? Whatever his name is. We don't see what he needs redeeming for. I will say that the cutscenes are at least nicely directed, it doesn't have the duct tape feel of the last two games here, which might make me grade it on a curve. As with most shooters of the era, Dark Sector has a gameplay gimmick. In this otherwise standard cover shooter, your main weapon is the Glaive, a metal boomerang that can channel elements like fire and electricity and be controlled mid-air to surgically cut off enemy limbs and target weak points. The elemental powers are also useful for puzzles, which feel pretty satisfying to complete and, unlike most other action games, don't feel like they get in the way of the action too much for too long. The Glaive is a pretty intuitive system, and I got used to the power throws, which can bisect enemies in showers of gore, pretty quickly. Curving a blade midair to decapitate multiple enemies, or quickly lighting groups on fire was satisfying, and made me feel like I was actually getting a better sense of control over these wild, infectious powers. The death animations, I should note, are also pretty great, and the game even has some limb-specific animations to reward players for shooting legs and arms out, a la RE4. On the subject of animations, this is an edgy mid 2000s shooter, so there are also some great execution moves that, I gotta be honest, never got old. Another small touch I appreciate is how the character aims with his gun while in cover, switching sides and styling his pistols under the arm or around the corner like he's Dante. It's goofy, but feels cool in the perfectly stereotyped way I would have loved when I was younger. Unfortunately, the rest of the game isn't as exciting. While shooting is fun enough, dumb enemy AI can cause unnecessary frustration as they either run right out, blasting at you, or stay a little too well hidden behind cover. The weapon selection is paltry at best, meaning the glaive is the most exciting thing you'll use for the 6-4 to four hours of runtime. The rest are regular hits like shotguns, assault rifles, etc. The cover system, while not the worst I've seen, isn't as precise as gears and can actually leave you open for damage a fair amount of the time, which is always frustrating. Enemy variety is also pretty lacking. While the game mixes it up a bit halfway through, you basically only ever fight two enemy factions, whose variations come in small, medium, large, and the same tactics always apply, shoot until dead. There are also a few set pieces, turret sequences, and vehicle sequences throughout that I think aren't very great, with the final one being a pretty frustrating assault against a lot of sniping rocket launchers. These moments aside, I do have to applaud the boss design. While they could occasionally be confusing or frustrating, they often required me to think quick and felt like true old-school bosses in how they were meant to test my reflexes. That being said, maybe the sewer lizard shouldn't have always been a one-hit kill. Just, just a thought. So Dark Sector is just... okay. It's edgy, forgettable, and not as good as its contemporaries, but in a way that's part of its charm. They don't make them like this anymore, and despite some minor frustrations, I had a good time throughout, which is more than I can say for the other two entries on this list. So, there it is. First round of our rankings placed Dark Sector as the best shooter of the PS3 360 era, something I hope nobody has said before. Will it get dethroned next episode? Probably, but subscribe, like, and stick around to find out. As always, thank you very much for watching. And if you feel like helping me get a better audio setup, get better video equipment, get everything I need to get up and running, please consider donating to my Patreon. 
as we will have a content roadmap out soon talking about what we plan on making here uh, as time goes on. If you also have any suggestions or any games you'd like to send in for this particular program, let me know, hit me up, and uh, we'll be able to, to get that going. Especially any suggestions, I have a big stack of Xbox 360 games I'm going through right now, and if you would like to see me play those, go subscribe to the Twitch channel. We will be live Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We're trying to hit 6 to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Again, thank you very much for watching, and have a good day.